Well, you folks know that tonight we're focusing on uh, the family. First Wednesday night of the month, we focus on missionaries. Second Wednesday night of the month, we focus on uh, spiritual growth and spiritual gifts. The third Wednesday night, we focus on the family. And then the last one, we focus on prayer. And so tonight, let me let me do mention this to you because I know that, that this fits some of you and some of you it does not. But let me share something with you that I thought was very interesting. Uh, a buddy of mine uh, went and heard a message one time from a pastor, and he sat there and he listened to the message, and the whole time he's listening to the message, he's thinking, I don't need to hear this. I know this. I have lived this in my faith, in my Christian life. I know all this. Why do I need to hear this again? It was the next day he was at work, and a friend of his came up to him and said, man, I really need help with this. Can you help me with this? And it was the very message that he heard the Sunday night before. And so don't ever take it for granted, even though you may say, I know this, or I don't need this, somebody needs this that you're going to be around. And so I encourage you uh, to uh, to kind of focus in tonight on what this message is about. Uh, it's about relationships, and uh, the title of it is simply, Home is Where the Heart Is. And so we're going to be looking at some things tonight about the home, and uh, I love talking about the home. I love talking about husbands and wives and children and relationships uh, because the family is ordained by God. Marriage is ordained by God. There are two institutions that God ordained. Number one is the, is the marriage and number two is the church. And uh, so these two are, are very important and we need to re realize that and remember that. But uh, I want to share this illustration with you and um, Hopefully this will kind of drive home what I'm trying to get across here. I've got a friend of mine who was married for 42 years. He and his wife uh, attended church on a relatively regular basis. She attended more than he did. And married 42 years, and all of a sudden, the, uh, the husband said to his wife, I can't live with you anymore. We're going we're gonna to get a divorce. Well, obviously it floored her. Because she's thinking, man, haven't we done everything right? We've been to church together. We're both believers. I mean, all these things are lined up. What has happened? And there are some principles tonight that we're going to look at, I believe, that crumbled in their family as a result of why they got the divorce. Now, I am happy to tell you that after two or three years, um, the man came to his senses and remarried her, and everything's good now. So, But still, things happen. And if we put things to practice and from God's Word, if we put God's Word, apply God's Word to our lives, then if we live out what God's Word tells us as it pertains to our families, then if we do it God's way, it's always going to be right. And, uh, and so I want to look tonight at uh, simply uh, about home is where the heart is. And Satan knows this fact. And he knows that if he can tear our relationships apart, he can destroy our homes. In this session... We're going to be looking at discovering roles for moms, for dads, for children, discovering roles and how to improve relationships uh, that God has given. And uh, in this way, Satan will never be able to gain a foothold in the family like he wants to if our hearts are turned toward God. And if our hearts are turned toward God, I just gave, just very recently, I did, I've uh, been doing some uh, uh, marital counseling, premarital counseling. And I said, here's the thing. If we love God the way we ought to, then whether it is a mom or a dad or children or whether it's your family at church, if, if we love God 100% like the Bible tells us to, love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then we're going to be able to love one another like we should. And I always say this in my marriage counseling, if Jesus is number one in your life, if you love him more than you love your husband or your wife, then you're going to love your husband and wife the way you ought to. And God gives us some instruction, particularly in the book of Ephesians uh, tonight. So we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5 uh, and Ephesians chapter uh, 6. And we'll look at a few verses tonight. But before we get into the Word of God, I want to mention something to you. We have many homes today that are what we would consider dysfunctional. Now, before someone gets their, their dander up and say, what do you mean dysfunctional families? What I mean by that is, if we are not following the Word of God, and what God says, then our family is dysfunctional. If moms are taking the place of dads, dads are taking the place of moms, and the children are running the show, running the home, then it's a dysfunctional family. 
Because God gives us commands in his word about how children are to behave, about how parents are to behave, about how husbands and wives are to behave as it relates to one another. So tonight we're going to be looking at, at some things. In Ephesians chapter 5, if you will, uh, we're going to look at chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. Ephesians 5, beginning at verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, where it is excess, but be you filled with the Spirit. Literally, what it says is, be ye being filled. If you look at it in the Greek, in the Koine Greek language, it's translated, but be you being filled. That is, continue day by day by day to be filled with the Spirit of God. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. Give thanks always for all things unto God the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Submission is key when it comes to relationships. Why do you say that, Brother Wayne? Well, I say that because I know this. So many times we let pride creep into our lives, whether you're a husband or wife or your child or whatever, that, that pride creeps in and you allow that to control your behavior as it relates to your family. And I want to tell you what, folks. The Bible says we submit ourselves one to another in the fear of God. That is, if we fear God, if we say we love God, if we fear God, then we're going to follow what God tells us to do as it relates to our families. And so God has much to say about this. And we're going to look at that uh, tonight. But you've heard the acrostic and that is J O Y. What does it stand for? J Joy stands for J for what? Jesus. Jesus Other. first, other second, and yourself last, or you last. Okay, or, I'm sorry, yourself. I tried J O Y. I'm having a hard time this, this evening. But um, there's one thing we've got to understand, and that it's not about us. It's about our relationship with the Lord Jesus. And relationships are important. And relationships. Take work. You see, a lot of people are not willing to put forth the effort in relationships, and many times that's why relationship crumbles. But if we follow the principles from God's Word, we are submitting ourselves one to another in the fear of God. God's number one in our life, and then follows after that our families. Folks, I want to tell you that we have got to understand that God is first, but family is second. And see, many times I think we get that all confused because... We, put, we may put God first, but we put work second, or we put uh, recreation second, and we don't put our family second after God. And that is obviously the wrong priorities to have. Our families ought to come right after our relationship with Christ, that personal relationship with Him. Now let me ask you a question. In the beginning, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 20 through 24, I believe, uh, it talks about the fact that uh, in the beginning God created man and woman, in that particular passage. Now, he wanted the family to be together. He wanted the husband and wife to be together. Now, I want you to consider this. There are different parts of the body, but many times we find out that many parts of the body come in pairs. For instance, you have two ears. Obviously, you don't have two noses, but you have two nostrils. You have two arms, you have two legs, you have two hands, you have two feet. So, many, many parts of the body come in pairs. Now, let me ask you this. Let's say, I'm just going to give you an example because this, this kind of gets home. If, uh, if you have two hands, or you have two arms, and this arm says, okay, I want to hold on to this, and this arm says, I want to hold on to this, and the two arms are not working together, one's going one direction, one's going the other, you really can't accomplish very much because you're always at odds with one another. But I believe God created man and woman to be to be together and to move together in a way that would be pleasing to God. And God gives us um, uh, some examples in his word about that. And so we're going to look at that in just a moment. Are we competitors or are we companions? As it relates to husbands and wives. Are we competitors or are we companions? I think many times we feel like that we're competitors in just about everything. You know, well, uh, you know, I make more money than you make. Or the children love me more than they love you. 
and, and this goes on and on and on. Sometimes I feel like families, it's, it's like this all the time. There's always fighting going on. And it feels like a competition. But God created us for companionship. He said it's not good that man would be alone. And so he created woman. And that they are companion. They are healthy, the Bible says. And so, um, can two walk together except they be agreed, the Bible says. I don't think so. Because the Bible says they can't. Can two walk together except they be agreed? One of the things we need to understand, folks, the Bible is very specific that we're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And it says that. And that means that if you are a Christian, you ought not to be married to a non-Christian. You ought not to enter into a relationship with someone who is not a Christian. And that is one reason why you find today that pastors many times will say, you know what, I cannot marry you because you're a believer and you're not a believer. And uh, the Bible is specific about that. I want to look tonight, I gave you a list, and we're going to look at these lists. And uh, we're going to look at this and, and try to go over some of these. And if you want to write these down, and there are several scripture verses I'm going to give, but there are 15 tips for a healthy marriage. We're going to go from this, and we're going to be talking about uh, what God expects of husbands and wives and children in just a moment. But I want to look at this first of all. These are tips for a healthy marriage. If you have a pen or a pencil, you can write these down. Write the scripture verses out that I give. Uh, I've got probably five or six different scripture verses I'm going to give uh, as we talk about this. But number one, these are tips for a healthy marriage. Number one, the Bible says that we are to leave and cleave. That is, that Matthew chapter 19 and verse 5, it says this, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. You know, part of the problem today is that a couple gets married, and they don't want to leave and cleave. They, they want to hang around mom and dad all the time. By the way, I know we're getting into some pretty touchy territory right here because mom and dad are thinking, I want them to just hang around. I want them to stay around. But the truth of the matter is, folks, God made us that when we get married, when we commit our lives to another individual, we leave and we cleave to our husband and wife. That's what God's plan is. But number two, except for a healthy marriage, be a team player. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. That is, we are to work together in this relationship that we have with, with ourselves, with each other, and with the Lord. We're to work together. We're not to fight against one another. I'm going to tell you, there's one thing that, that happens as it relates to children and husbands and wives. Have you ever had a, a situation, or maybe I should say that, do you ever know someone who has a situation where... The son or the daughter is always saying, you know, Mom, can I do this? Can I go to this party? Can I do this? And the mom says no, and then they go to the dad. Dad, would, would you mind if I went to the... And then they get the mom and dad going, going at it. Why don't you let it go? Why don't you let this happen? And so we've got to be careful that, that we're working together in this relationship and not against one another. Number three, avoid an argument that is not allowed to end. Now, we're going to have arguments. I know that. Why? Because we're different. But don't ever allow an argument to not end. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. That is, if there's an issue, uh, you know, do not go to bed angry. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. But then also, uh, number four, avoid character assassination. assassination. I cannot even say it. Assassinations. Now what I mean by that is this. And folks, I'm going to tell you, this is wrong, but I cannot tell you how many times I've heard preachers get up in the pulpit and bash their wives over and over and over again. I've heard it. Now, if they were doing it in fun and in joking, but it doesn't matter if you're joking or not, you ought not to talk down about your wife. And vice versa. Ladies, you should not bash your husbands. Listen, you ought to love one another. You ought to say things that encourage one another, lift one another up. Because if you are always putting one another down, then that is not what God would have you to do. So, uh, avoid character assassinations. That is, avoid times when you're putting down your spouse. Number five, look for, uh, look for and encourage the best in your spouse. You know, one of the things uh, when my wife decided that, you know, we felt like it was of the Lord and she wanted to pursue uh, 
her further her education. You know what? I was 100 percent for it. Matter of fact, I tried to encourage her as much as I could. Now I don't know how much of an encouragement I was, but I tried to encourage her as much as I could. And I feel like that we need to encourage and bring out the best in that one that is your mate. But number six, continue your courtship. Keep that love alive. My papa, I think I may have told you this before. Uh, my papa was old school. I mean, he he was a very hard man, but he was a hard worker, and you know he did his best to take care of his family. But I remember my papa saying in front of my mom all the time. I was over at the house. I was probably about five or six years old, and I heard my mom all say, "Hollis." That was my papa's name, Hollis. H.A. Griffin. They call him H.A. all the time. And she said, "Hollis, why don't you ever tell me you love me?" And my papa said, I told you the day we got married, and when I changed my mind, I'll let you go. And I, you know, I mean, it's funny to think about that. But folks, seriously though, we need to cultivate our relationship with the Lord. You know, we, we need to keep that love alive. What happens when you come home and your husband or your wife, they're in this constant battle. Every time you come home, you argue and you fuss and you fight. But then when the husband goes to work or the wife goes to work, and they see somebody else at work that's always saying, oh, I feel so bad for you, and can I help you? And they begin to get involved emotionally with them, and guess what happens? There's unfaithfulness. And so keep that love alive in your home. Go on dates with your wife or your husband. Spend special times together. Make time uh, during the week that you can spend time together. And I know today, listen, we have got, our world today is so busy that we don't have time to sneeze, much less spend time with our spouses, it seems like sometimes. But I'm going to tell you, you need to make time to spend time with them. So uh, continue your courtship and keep your love alive. Number seven, I already mentioned, never go to bed angry. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, let not the sun go down under wrath. It's important that I know we're going to have disagreements. You're going to have husbands and wives that have disagreements sometimes, and you're going to you know, you're going to kind of go at it a little bit. I'm not talking about physical abuse. I'm talking about verbal stuff going on. And so, but the Bible says, do not let the sun go down in your wrath. That is, do not go to bed angry. It's important that we remember that. Also, number eight, talk things over freely and be open and honest. One of the things that causes, uh, there are two things, two major things that cause divorce today. Number one is communication, and number two is finances. Communication and finances. Learn to communicate with one another. Here's what happens. And, and this, this has happened. As a matter of fact, I've counseled with couples and they've told me this and I know this, that this is to be true. You know, generally speaking, a man will, will come home and he does something and he don't know what he's done, but he's done something. Okay? And his wife is upset with him and he don't know what he's done. And so he begins to go to her and say, what have I done? What can I do to make this right? I'm sorry, you know. And the wife's like, I don't want to talk about it. Don't talk to me right now. I don't want to talk about it. And what happens is, because that communication has broken up, then they both go to bed, and he's wondering what he's done, and she's still mad, and they wake up the next morning, and they haven't settled what the situation is about. And so do not let the sign go down and wrap. Don't go to bed angry. Make sure that you settle whatever arguments or disagreements that you have before you go to bed. And then, um, let's see. Where, where am I at? Okay, number eight. Oh, number nine. Cooperate and work together. That's very simple, very self-explanatory. But number ten, it's support, folks. Number ten, help each other grow spiritually. Help each other grow spiritually. God placed your husband and your wife in your life to be a help me, to be a help to you. Help each other grow spiritually. Read the Bible together. Guys, I'm going to tell you, this is your responsibility. The Bible is very specific that you are to be the head of the home. You are to lead that home for the Lord. And you need to be a help to your wife, and your wife needs to be a help to you. You read the Bible together. You pray together. You have that time alone together with the Lord. And guys, I'm going to tell you, there are, there are men that I've heard that say, well, you know, I just don't feel comfortable praying in front of anybody. Well, you need to learn to be comfortable praying in front of your wife. You need to pray together. You've heard the old saying, a family that prays together stays together. I really believe that's true. Uh, so, uh, help each other grow. Number 11, 
Put grace in place. Give what each other needs, not necessarily what we think they want. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? Jesus gave us not what we deserved. He gave us what we needed. We needed grace. We needed mercy. And that's what he extended to us. And we need to learn to do the same thing with those of our spouses. Put grace in place. I want to uh, mention a story to you, a very simple story, but it's one that I've, I've remembered for the last 20 years. Brother Wayne Wagner told this story, and he actually told it at a senior saints meeting uh, over in Ashland City about 20 years ago. And what Brother Wayne said was, he said, there was a young man uh, by the name of, I think he said his name was John, if I'm not mistaken. The name really is irrelevant because the story's going to be the same. But little Johnny... Every, uh, every day would come over to Mr. Wilson's house and he would borrow a baseball glove because the kids love to go to the park and they love to, to play baseball together. And so little Johnny would go over and borrow the glove, didn't have his own glove, very poor. And uh, so anyway, it, it became winter time. Obviously they're not out there playing baseball in the winter. But Johnny and a friend of his are walking down the sidewalk. I'm trying to picture a place, it probably like downtown Clarksville because there were sidewalks and things like that. So Johnny and his friend look, and they see Mr. Wilson coming down the walkway. And, of course, there's snow on the ground. And so Johnny and his friend decide, come on, we're going to ball up some snowballs. We're going to hit Mr. Wilson when he walks by. And so these are kids being kids. They reach down, and they get the snowballs. What they didn't know was Johnny picked up a snowball, and inside it was a rock. And so he had patted it, didn't realize a rock was in there. And so as Mr. Wilson walked by, they're behind him. And both of them just chunk the ball. Johnny's hit Mr. Wilson in the back of the head. Obviously, the snow smashed, and then the rock hit the back of his head. So it hurt pretty good. Well, Mr. Wilson turns around to look to find out what who did it, and he saw in the corner of his eye Johnny and this other boy running behind a tree. Boy, Mr. Wilson was hot. I mean, he was mad as fire. He was so mad, he was fuming. And so he immediately he, he started walking toward Johnny's house. And he said, man, I'm going to make sure he gets what he, gets what he deserves. And so he, uh, he walks up to the front door, but before he rang the doorbell, he realized, you know what? I don't need to do this. I need to do something else. So he turns around, he goes back home, goes to his house, and then he comes back to Johnny's. He rings the doorbell, knocks on the door. His, Johnny's mom comes to the door. Well, Johnny's upstairs under the bed. He is scared to death because he's afraid somebody's going to find out what's going on. So he's up there under his bed, he's shaking, and he's scared. And Mr. Wilson came in, and uh, his mom said, well, come on in, Mr. Wilson, we'll invite you in. And he said, no, I can't stay. I just wanted to bring this glove to Johnny. You know, he's all the time borrowing this glove, and he said, he needs this glove. He doesn't have one. And, and rather than him having to borrow it, bringing it back forth, I'm just going to give him the glove. It belonged to my son. My son's no longer at home. I want to give him the glove. Well, Johnny hears his mom walking up the steps. And he's thinking, man, I'm in trouble. And she opens the door and said, hey, guess what? Mr. Wilson just came by, and he gave you the glove. And so uh, Johnny immediately begins to cry. And he runs out of the room and runs down the steps with the glove in his hand. And he runs over to Mr. Wilson's house. He rings the doorbell, sobbing, crying. Mr. Wilson comes to the door, and he said, Mr. Wilson, I don't deserve this. I, I can't take this because I'm the one that threw that snowball. And Mr. Wilson began to say this. Johnny, I know what you did. I know that you don't deserve it, but you needed it. And then he said this, that's the same way Jesus was with us. We deserved hell. We deserved punishment. But through his grace, he gave us what we didn't deserve. He gave us grace. And so uh, it's important to remember that in your relationship, whether it is your husband or wife or whatever relationship that you have, remember that we need to extend grace Put grace in place. But then number 12, do not flirt with temptation. Guys, keep your eyeballs turned away from that which would be tempting to you. It's important to remember this. The Bible says that if you look on a woman to lust after her, you have committed adultery in your heart already. So it's important not just the things that you do, it's important the thoughts that you have. If you even think that hatred towards someone in your heart is just like murder is what God says. So, it's important what you think just as much as what you do. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he, the Bible says. So, when it comes to temptation, keep away from temptation. By the way, ladies, it involves you too, because ladies are tempted just like men are. 
And, uh, and so it's important to remember, do not flirt with temptation. If you've got a coworker and it seems like they're trying to come on to you, you get out of dodge. You don't stay around. You get, get distance yourself from them. You do not put yourself in a position where there is temptation and where there is a chance that you will fall into sin. So do not flirt with temptation. Number 13, pray together. I cannot stress this enough. Pray together. The Bible commands us to pray over and over and over and over again. But especially, even in your relationships, learn what it means to pray together. Number 14, keep Christ in the center of your home. I was reading an interesting story the other day, and uh, matter of fact, Steve Trail, he's a pastor friend of mine, pastor down in uh, Dothan, Alabama. And he was telling this story about a, a young man that uh, was in the, the neighborhood, and, and this lady, this elderly lady, had walked out of the grocery store, and this young man, very nicely dressed, clean haircut, he walks out of the grocery store, well, the lady stumbles, and she drops her groceries all over the, all over the ground. And the bag rips open, and she's trying to get down, but she can't quite get down to the ground to pick everything up, and so this young man walks over, he said, man, let me help you. He goes into the store, he gets some more grocery bags, he comes out and begins to load everything into the, into the bags. And the lady was so impressed, she said, young man, she said, how did you turn in to be such a young man, such a good young man like you are? And he said, well, when I was young, I had a drug problem. And she said, what? You had a drug price, that why you're the way you are now? He said, yes, ma'am, it is. He said, every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, my mom and dad drove me to church. And so he had a drug problem. And I want to tell you, that, that is really important, folks. We have got to uh, keep Christ the very center place in our homes. And I, what I mean by that is, not only husbands and wives, but we make sure that our children, all of our family is in church. All of our family is putting, we put Christ in the very center of the home. But then number 15, the last one, is work God's plan. God has a plan for the home. God has a plan for a husband and wife and children. And if you do it God's way, you work God's plan, it will work. It will work. So it's important to remember those things. Just a few tips. Uh, and I want to encourage you to do something. Those particular things that I gave you, I did give you some scripture verses. But there are more scripture verses. And so if you will, your homework is to go home and try to find some other scripture verses that I did not give you because they're there. Each one of those principles that I gave you has scripture verses that pertain uh, to what I'm talking about. So, all right. Um, now, we're going to look at some scripture verses as it relates to husbands, wives, and children. And what I want to do is I want us to look at Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 22. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. This, this kind of gives you an idea of what God expects for men, for women, and for children as it pertains to the family. And here they go. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. And I'm going to stop right there because many times when I say, husband or wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, then immediately the radar goes off and they, they begin to be upset and say, what do you mean? I'm not submitting myself to anybody. Well, notice what the last part of that verse said. As unto the Lord. Submit yourself to your own husbands as unto the Lord. You know what that means? If you're not willing to submit yourself to your husband, you're not willing to submit yourself to God because God said to do this. Okay? So it's important. I'm not trying to step on toes. I'm just simply telling you what God says. If that's steps on toes, that's fine. Um, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. And then also in Colossians chapter 3, verse 18, kind of a similar thing. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, as it is fit unto the Lord. This is God's plan. It's not really Wayne's plan. It's God's. And so it is a command that wives are to be in submission to their husbands as unto the Lord. And so it's important to remember that. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 25, just a few verses down, or one more, one more verse down. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it unto himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or anything, 
but that it should be holy and without blemish. So all men also to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined together to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And then also in Colossians chapter 3, verse 19, Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. And here's the problem. Why did God command? Should wives love their husbands? Absolutely. I believe that is fitting and proper. But here's the thing. Why did God tell husbands to love their wives and wives to submit themselves to their husbands? Because I believe God hit us where we are. Generally speaking, men do not love as willingly and as easily as women do. Right? I mean, it's, a, it's the natural thing for a mother to cherish and to love, especially as it relates to family and to children. It is just almost built in, I think. It's something that God has placed in every, every mother's heart, every wife's heart. It is to nourish and cherish love. And so God tells the man, love your wives as Christ loved the church. It doesn't mean that you're to hoard your authority over your wife. It means that you are to love her as Christ loved the church and gave himself. For it. You know what that means? That means you ought to be self-sacrificing when it comes to the relationship with your wife. You are to be a servant as Christ served, as Christ loved. You are to love and serve as it pertains to your wife. You know what? I love doing things for my wife. But I want to tell you what. You can talk to her and she'll tell you the same thing. She has no problem when I'm loving her the way God wants me to love her. She has no problem submitting to my authority as far as God's concerned. She'll tell you the same thing. Am I not right? She's shaking her head. You know why? Because if I'm loving her the way that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, then she's not only going to love me, but she's going to follow what I say as I follow the Lord. And so that's the key, as we follow the Lord. And so it's important to remember that. I try to treat my wife like a queen, and she treats me like a queen. Not a queen. <laughs> I should have said that. She treats me like a king, and I'm telling you, she does, folks. But it's because I do what I can to treat her like the queen. And so it's so important. You know, we think we think this life is all about what somebody can do for us. You know what? That's not what the attitude of the mind of Christ was. It wasn't. He didn't come down here and say, everybody bow down to me and worship me. He came down here for one reason, and that is to give his life for folks, to give his life for you and for me, to become that servant. And so, you know what? With leadership comes tremendous responsibility. And we need to remember that. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as unto the Lord. But also, when we're talking about children, Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first man with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long upon the earth. I remember, uh, I think it may have been my whole pastor, my brother Jack Rollins, was up preaching one day, and uh, he had just witnessed before the service, he witnessed a child in the church service disrespecting his mom and dad. And I'm going to tell you, my, my pastor, he, he was as loving a preacher as I've ever known, and I'm going to tell you, he was as to the point as a preacher will ever be. And he looked at this young man as he's preaching, and he hit this very passage, and it said, Children, obey your parents. Honor your father and mother, that you may live long on the earth. And he pointed at that young man, and he said, he called his name out. I was sitting over here. And he said, Son, you want to live long, or you want God to take you out? And he was like, he kind of stepped back, and he said, If you don't obey your parents, or you don't honor your parents, you're not going to live long on this earth. And man, listen, by the way, that young man became a preacher. And uh, he is serving God today. So, but it's true, though. Is God's word true or is it not true? If God said, if you, if you obey your parents and you honor your parents, you're going to live long on the earth, you believe that? I do. I have seen case after case after case that that was the way it was. I remember uh, there was an elderly lady that went to church with us when I was growing up. Uh, her name was, let me think, uh, oh my goodness, what was her name? Miss Reeves. Miss Reeves, one of the godliest ladies I've ever known. As a matter of fact, she would come to me every Sunday. When I was growing up, she probably was about 86, 87 years old. Still served the Lord, still loving the Lord, was there every time the doors were open. And Miss Reeves came in, and uh, uh, 
so anyway, I asked him one day, and this, man, this was a very, very, very difficult thing to ask, but I asked him because I was a kid didn't know any better. But I said, Miss Reeves, how did you live to be so old? And she said, let me show you the scripture. And she turned to Ephesians chapter 6, and she said, God has blessed me because I honored my parents and I obeyed my parents. And by the way, she lived to be 98 years old, I believe it was. Um, and it hasn't been that long ago that she, a little while ago that she passed away. But it's true. Children are to obey parents. And, and parents, I'll tell you, if you do not do the things that are necessary to make your children obey and honor, do you think they're going to honor God if they want to honor you? Do you think they're going to live for God and, and obey God and honor Him if they're not willing to honor and obey you? So it's, it's a spiritual issue. And we think, oh, well, they'll be okay. They'll learn one day, you know. They may get put in jail a couple of times, but they'll eventually learn. Folks, it is your responsibility as a parent to train them up in the way that they should go, the Bible says. And so it's important to remember that. We are to train them. And let me just share with this with you. We are not to provoke them into wrath. And I think many times we provoke our children to wrath. We punish them, we discipline them out of anger. And that's not the way God would have it. You know, one of the things, when, when Megan was little, I give this illustration because it's, it's what my experience has been. One of the things that we tried to do when Megan was growing up is if we had to punish her, it's very hard not to punish when you're angry. I mean, it really is because you see them doing something wrong and you're just thinking, you know, I just want to, anyway. Um, so... But what we are to do is we are to train them to love the Lord and to serve Him and obey Him. But as we punish, as we discipline, we need to sit them down and say, you know what, there are consequences when you do wrong. And here's why this punishment is having to happen. And we do it not out of anger, but out of love. And I know that's very hard to do, but, but the Bible talks about the fact that we are not to provoke our children to wrath. I remember one time, and by the way, I... I would tell this to my dad because my dad knows that this is true and I would not say anything I would not say to him. But I remember one time, my dad uh, was so angry with me and he whooped me, well my dad whooped me a lot of times, that didn't really bother me. But whooping is just one of those things I just knew was coming, you know, all the time. Uh, so, and I, I'm very thankful my dad did, by the way, so don't get me wrong. But I remember one time, and I can't remember the exact situation, but I remember, you know, my dad always had kind of a, uh, a very solemn face when he would spank me, and that was okay. You know, I understood that what I did was wrong. But I remember one time my dad whipped me, and I looked into his eyes, and I could see the anger in his eyes. And I'm going to tell you, I never forgot that. And I'm going to tell you something else. I went into my room, and I didn't do this other times, but that particular time, I went into my room, I slammed my door, and, and uh, I basically said, I'm leaving, and I'm not coming back. And I was a little kid, by the way. I was like seven or eight years old. So, but here's the thing. I knew that my dad was angry. I knew that he was mad. And I knew that he, he punished me out of anger and not out of like he did other times. But I remember that time. And so, uh, but I say that to say this. When I look back on my life and I see a mom and dad that loved me enough to punish me, to spank me, to ground me, or whatever they had to do, I would not be the person that I am today were it not for that discipline. And do not ever think that if you spank your child, I saw a report on the news, or on the, one of the news channels, just, I think it may have been last, last night, where they were talking about, should you spank your children? You know, and I think there was a case, some, a sports a football player had spanked his children or something, I can't remember. So they were discussing it, and they said, we don't think you ought to spank your children. Well, they haven't read the Bible. They haven't read the passage where it said, if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. And so it's important to remember this, that we need to discipline, but not provoke our children to wrath. I want to read this, and then we're going to close tonight. But I want to read this. This is Matthew Henry commentary. Matthew Henry is, is, is a layman's commentary, and obviously this is from years ago, and so some of the language is a little bit different. Uh, but I want you to listen to this. It's from Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. But it says this, Do not provoke your children to wrath. And then Matthew Henry said this about this passage. Though God has given you power, you must not abuse that power, remembering that your children are, in a particular manner, 
pieces of yourselves, and therefore ought to be governed with great tenderness and love. Be not impatient with them, use no unreasonable severities, and lay no rigid injunctions upon them. When you caution them, when you counsel them, when you reprove them, do it in such a manner as not to provoke them to wrath. In all such cases, deal prudently and wisely with them, endeavoring to convince their judgments and to work upon their reason. Bring them up well in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, in the discipline and proper and compassionate correction, and in the knowledge of that duty which God requires of them, and by which they may become better acquainted with Him. Give them a good education. It is great. It is a the great duty of parents to be careful in educating their children, not bringing them up as the brutes do, taking care to provide for them, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, in such a manner as is suitable to their reasonable natures. Nay, not only bring them up as men, but nurture in nurture and admonition, but as Christians in the admonition of the Lord. Let them have a religious education. Instruct them to fear sinning, and inform them of and excite them to the whole duty, the whole of their duty toward God. Think about that. Raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You love them as God would have you love them, but you admonish them. You train them. You teach them what God would have them to do. And if they step out of line, then you punish them. That's, that's the important thing. You let them understand there are consequences when they do wrong. You teach them that sin is wrong and that sin is against God. Teach them, as the psalmist David said, I have sinned against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Sin is ultimately against God. It may involve other people, but it's ultimately against God. And we've got to teach our children to hate sin and to love God. And so tonight, maybe it's an encouragement, and if you may say, Run away. I may not need to hear this, but I've got a, a daughter or a son or someone that needs to hear this, and I want to share with them what was said tonight. And if that's the case, then to God be the glory. Folks, it's important that our relationships are God-driven. That we seek His Word for counsel, that we look into the Word of God, and if God says it, then we follow it. If God says not to, then we don't follow it, as it pertains to our families, our children, our wives, our husbands, our families. So tonight, think about these things and encourage others uh, to think about them as well. So let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you tonight for the Word of God. For it's, it says of itself that it's quick, it's sharp, powerful, and intuitive sword. For it, it really speaks to us uh, in ways that changes us. And so Lord, I pray tonight as, as we've read the words that you've given us about the family, God, I pray that every husband in this place would love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. God, I pray that every wife would be in submission to her husband as unto the Lord. I pray that all the children, Lord, would be obedient to their parents and would honor their parents. Lord, I just ask that your blessings would be upon the reading of your word in our hearts. And God, I pray that, Lord, as you spoke to us tonight, Lord, help us not to push things aside and say, well, I don't think that's what that means. Lord, that is the Word of God. And Lord, we need to follow what your Word says. We need to put in practice the roles that you have specifically given us as it relates to moms and dads and to children. So God, encourage us, strengthen us, help us to be what we need to be for you. Equip us and give us what we need to live our lives the very best we can for you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Dwayne, real quick. Yes. Just a reminder to everybody that on Saturday night, we'll be showing the movie outside at 7.30 p.m., God's Not Dead. There's been a, a number of uh, good Christian movies that have come out over the past few months, and, and this one's a really, really good, powerful movie. Um, so this is something new for us to show us outside. Um, and if it were to rain, I think everything's going to be clear, but if it were to rain, we'll show it inside the building. Uh, but a great opportunity to invite family and friends uh, to come and and see the movie. The movie has a powerful message, and uh, it's going to be really good. If anybody is able to help out um, about an hour beforehand, about 6.30, we're going to pop popcorn and kind of get things ready for the snacks and stuff like that. So, um, and invite and folks. Oh, yeah, there's just a, a few.